Hello, everyone. We're just about ready to begin. Uh, just a couple of announcements. One, uh, this session will not be offering CPE. Uh, we apologize for that, but our uh, learning team has been overwhelmed this week with the number of webinars and information we've had to, to get out, and we wanted to get this information to you as quickly as possible. Uh, secondly, if you are looking for information about the Paycheck Protection Program and those loans, we will not be covering that today. We will be talking, spending a little bit of time talking about the payroll retention credit and payroll tax deferral, but we will not be talking about the SBA Forgivable Loans Program. So if you're looking for that information, uh, please go to our Cherry Beckert website where there is a webinar recording, uh, frequently asked questions, information there that you can access about those programs. Please also take a look in the handouts pod. In the handouts pod is a copy of today's slides. And also we have our instructors available to answer questions. They'll be answering questions that you type in as we go along uh, and including comments in our presentation. It's a lot of material for us to cover today, but just wanted to make sure that I had those um, areas covered with us. So uh, just real quickly as we move forward, Please remember that this is not a comprehensive review. This law is uh, about a week old, a um, little over a week now, and we have not received much in the way of guidance about many of these topics. So it is developing as we go along. We'll give you as, as current information as we have, but please know that if uh, there may be other considerations as more information comes out. Our speakers today, um, Barry Wines, Michael Elliott and myself, we're all directors working in our uh, federal tax services area, providing a uh, resource, particularly when it comes to new laws and new information. Barry oversees uh, corporate tax issues for the firm and Michael oversees partnership tax issues. Uh, and Dawn Poland is a senior manager in our credits and accounting methods team and she oversees cost segregation studies fixed asset studies and other analysis all deal with dealing with cost recovery programs. So we're uh, looking forward to what these folks have to share with us today. And today, as I mentioned, we're gonna be talking about the CARES Act and its impact on the tax provisions related to individuals, uh, related to businesses, the change in the, or a technical correction provided for qualified improvement property. We have a new definition for that and a shorter life for cost recovery there. And uh, 163J limitations on deducting interest expense. Very complicated set of rules there that apply. Again, we are not talking about the Paycheck Protection Program loans. So if you're looking for that information, please go to our uh, Cherry Becker or cbh.com website. Let's begin talking about how the CARES Act is impacting individuals. Of course, the, the hot topic that got a lot of news for individuals is a new 2020 tax credit that was introduced by the, the CARES Act law. <clears throat> this is $1,200 for individual taxpayers or $2,400 for, in the case of a, a couple filing a joint return, <clears throat> plus $500 for each qualifying child of the taxpayer. A qualifying child is defined under the child tax credit provisions of the code. That means children who are under 17 years old uh, will qualify, but if you have a, a, a college student or an older child who may still be a dependent, they're not gonna qualify for this uh, credit. The credit is, immediately available for refunding to or rebating to taxpayers. They can collect it now, even though it's a 2020 credit, it will be paid out right now. The credit is subject to phase out for uh, adjusted gross incomes that exceed a certain levels. And you can see those levels here, say $150,000 in the case of a, a married filing joint return or $75,000 for an individual taxpayer return. And that's phased out at 5% for any amounts of income in, X of that, in, in excess of those thresholds. So let's look at a quick example. Here we have a married couple with two children and adjusted gross income of $190,000. Their maximum credit allowed would be $2,400 for the couple plus two children at 500 apiece would mean their maximum credit is $3,400. Uh, 
because their adjusted gross income is above the 150,000 threshold, they would be phased out of about $2,000 of that credit. So they would be eligible for a rebate of $1,400 and the IRS will send them a check for $1,400. But again, this is a 2020 credit. So how is the IRS gonna know that's the right amount of credit for 2020? Well, the IRS is gonna look at the last return filed by this couple. So if it was a 2019 return, they're gonna look at the adjusted gross income and number of children on that return. Uh, if their 2019 return has not been filed, the IRS will look to 2018 and calculate the tax based on that return. So that's how they're coming out with this number. Well, what happens when the couple actually files their 2020 return? At that point, the credit is recalculated. And if the adjusted gross income is actually less than it was in the amount that calculated the credit, say, in 2020, it's only $175,000 rather than 190 dollars as it was in 2019. Well, the actual credit allowed is going to be more. <clears throat> so in this case, they would be eligible for $2,150 of credit. They already received $1,400, so they would get the extra $750 when they filed their 2020 tax return. The really good news is that if the 2020 tax return calculates a smaller credit, in this case, if the couple's income was 225,000, they would be completely phased out of a credit and they would not be allowed to have any credit, but they already received the rebate of $1,400. Do they have to pay that back? No, they do not. It's a real win-win for taxpayers. If you're eligible for more credit when you file your 2020 return, you are awarded more. If you uh, calculate and you should receive less credit, you do not have to repay any of that credit received in the rebate. Another provision that is helpful to taxpayers who do not itemize their returns, that is they're taking a standard deduction, is uh, the code provides for a $300 deduction for cash contributions made in 2020 to qualified organizations. That's basically gonna be your 501c3 and similar type organizations. It's cash donations, and this is a $300 credit. It only applies to those taxpayers who will be taking, claiming the standard deduction and not itemizing their deductions. For those that itemize, the IRS has increased the limitations. Right now, most contributions, cash contributions, are limited to 60% of adjusted gross income, but that limit is raised to 100% for qualifying contributions. For corporations, donation deductions are limited usually to 10% of income. In this case, that limit is raised to 25% of income for these deductions. And again, this is gonna be cash contributions to qualifying organizations and the donations made in 2020. Excess business losses. Uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act introduced section 461L, and this section was designed to slow down the recognition of large amounts of business and farm losses by tax individual taxpayers and trusts, non-corporate taxpayers. Well, they've gone back and the CARES Act goes back and amends this from the beginning. So it applied to tax years beginning after 2017. So really 18, 19 and forward to the end of 2025. They've gone back and revised this and removed this provision, made it no longer applicable to tax years in ending uh, 2018, 19 and 20. Now, after that point, farm losses are still eligible to be taken without limitation. In other words, excess farm losses is no longer are no longer disallowed or no longer deferred. Uh, excess business losses does come back into play for 2021 through 2025. Uh, and when that does come back into play in 2021, the IRS has, in, oh, excuse me, the CARES Act has clarified how the excess business loss can be calculated. And there were some questions from the earlier act, so this really helps that. So again, if you uh, had some losses that were not allowed because they exceeded the $250,000 threshold uh, in a your 2018 tax return, or it looks like you might be limited for 2019, that those limitations are now removed and you can deduct those business losses in full. 
retirement plan distributions during 2020 uh, because of if there are issues for individuals related to the coronavirus then distribution distributions can be made out of retirement savings plans up to hundred thousand dollars without incurring a 10 percent penalty and these distributions can be taxed on the income portion, not the penalty portion, but on the income portion, ratably over three years. And these amounts can be recontributed back into an IRA or in, into the plan over the same three year period. Uh, we see this frequently with uh, natural disasters in areas where there have been hurricanes, the California fires, uh, other large areas that are impacted by natural disasters. This ability to draw money out of a retirement plan is for, for these situations is available. Similarly, uh, loans can be taken out of plans. Now, this is a shorter window of time instead of being all of 2020. This is a shorter window from March 27th through September 23rd. Uh, and there are some benefits to allow people to take these loans out under the coronavirus. And for lo existing loans, there's an opportunity to uh, delay and defer some payments. And the other interesting thing is the CARES Act removed the required minimum distributions from IRAs, uh, uh, employer defined contribution plans, 403Bs, and 457B plans for government employers, that is state and local uh, government plans. It does not apply to tax exempt 407B plans. But uh, no longer do taxpayers, are they required to take out their minimum distribution? And that even includes those taxpayers who reached age 70 and a half in 2019 and deferred their first uh, required minimum distribution to 2020. Those two are not required to be taken out in this tax year. So if you had distributions taken out early under your required minimum distributions, you might talk to your um, uh, plan administrator about uh, whether you still are within the 60-day window to do a rollover into another retirement IRA or into another plan in order to uh, put that money back into retirement savings if that's helpful to you. Great. All right. So, hello, everyone. Um, so, I'm not sure how familiar everybody is with this, but uh, one of the changes that came about as a part of the Tax Cuts and Job Act is uh, they started limiting the deduction for business interest paid. Uh, anything relating to the trade or business was limited after 2017. So uh, under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the limit was 30% of your adjusted taxable income. And that's, we're gonna use acronyms here just so I don't have to <laughs> say it out, every, speak it out every single time. But ATI is basically your EBITDA. 30% um, of your EBITDA is, is pretty much your limit. Plus, if you have business interest income, we call that BII, uh, you can offset 100% of that against, you know, with interest expense. Uh, and then floor plan financing interest, if you uh, if you have an auto dealership or anything where, where you have floor plan financing interest, that's not subject to any kind of limit at all. But basically your net interest expense in excess of your business interest income is limited to 30% of ATI. And that's for generally uh, before the CARES Act for years after 2017. Um, now, one of the changes that they made as a result of, the uh, of this CARES Act that just came out, and this applies for 2019 and 2020, generally speaking. Now, partnerships are subject to a different role. Um, for 2019, and I'll get to that later. But but generally, this is the rule that um, normally you'd be limited to 30% of your ATI, but in 2019 and 2020, your your limit is now 50% of ATI. So that enables taxpayers to theoretically take more of an interest deduction uh, than they otherwise would have would have been allowed to. Uh, everything else about the the rule is the same, but uh, that's a special rule for for 19 and 20. Um, Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, now, beginning in 2020, you have another option. Now, if your 2019 ATI winds up being higher than your 2020 ATI and it winds up giving you a better answer, you can you can actually use your 2019 ATI in 2020 and, and calculate your limit based on that. Uh, so the election to use the 2019 in a partnership setting is actually made by the partnership, not the partners, but otherwise uh, any taxpayer can actually make this election. And, uh, but there is a special rule. If you wind up having a short tax year in 2020 because you have a, a final year tax return for your business, then uh, it gets prorated based on what your 2019 ATI was. You can't use your 100% of your 2019 ATI. If you're, if you're only in business for five months in, in uh, 2020, you can use 
five twelfths of your uh, your 2019 ATI. All right. Um, so the impact of these rules that there's there's a little bit of a difference for partnerships here, uh, in the sense that in 2019 they're still subject to that 30 percent limit, but there's another special rule to give them some relief uh, for the following year that that is not available to others, but. Everybody else is 50% of ATI in 2019. But as a, just a review of the time frame, remember in 2017 there was no limit. Uh, this is potentially a different answer for interest expense for uh, six years in a row for certain taxpayers. 2018, everybody was subject to this 30% of ATI limit. 2019, um, everybody but partnerships gets increased to 50%, but partnerships are still stuck at 30%. Then 20, uh, in 2020, it goes up to 50% uh, of ATI for everybody. And then in 2021, it goes back to 30% of ATI. And then in 2022, they've actually modified the, uh, the definition of ATI. There's a, you don't get to add back depreciation and amortization in 2022. So, so now the limit is going to be based on a lower amount, even though it's 30% of ATI, it's a, it's a modified form of ATI. So you're going to get very different answer, answers for interest expense. For, uh, for six years in a row, potentially. Uh, next slide. Okay, so partnerships, remember I said in, uh, in 20, uh, sorry, 2019, you're still subject to that 30% limit. In 2020, it goes to 50% of ATI. But now we, we have something, a concept called excess business interest expense or EBIE for short, which is really the excess. It's the interest expense that, uh, that a partnership has uh, above and beyond the limit. So to the extent that the partnership can't deduct it, it actually pushes that excess business interest expense down to the partners. It lowers their basis and their partnership interest. And then the partners personally have to carry it forward until the next uh, next tax year. And it actually lowers their basis. Uh, next slide, please. All right, and now prior to the CARES Act, there's really only three ways for partners to deduct their EBIE. Uh, the, the same partnership that allocated the EBIE would have to allocate something called excess taxable income to, to the partner in the future, or, or EBII, which is excess business interest income to the partner, uh, to absorb that, that, uh, that prior year EBIE. Um, what that basically means is, let's just say the, uh, the, the partnership uh, went up having, uh, could have theoretically deducted more interest expense than what it actually had. So the partnership winds up being able to deduct all of its interest expense, and then it has some of its limit left over. It can push that down to the partner in the form of ETI. And that would enable the partner then to use that ETI to absorb any, any previously carried forward EBIE. Uh, now, the other thing that could happen is the same partnership that's, uh, that, that allocated the EBIE becomes no longer subject to, to these, these limits. So there's a small business taxpayer exception that is a year-by-year -year test, and it, it may not have met it this year, but it, it could meet it next year. So if the partnership is no longer subject to, to the 163J rules, uh, that actually frees up the interest expense that's being carried forward by the partners, and they can then deduct it at that point. And then the third way is if the partner is unable to deduct that interest expense, uh, and they later deduct their, uh, they dispose of their partnership interest, they they have to uh, they have to reduce their basis at the time it was allocated. They get to add back any unused interest expense back to their basis. So that's generally the only three ways that you can deduct it. But the CARES Act now provided a fourth way. So remember I said that in 2019, the partnerships are still subject to that 30% limit. Uh, but what happens is the partners then have to carry it forward until 2020. But 50% of whatever they carried forward from 2019 is not subject to those, those limits I just explained on the last slide. They can just deduct 50% of it without any kind of limit in 2020. And then the remaining 50% of that, that, uh, that 2019 EBIE that's being carried forward is still subject to that, that, those same three limits that I described on the last slide. Uh, so a partner can actually elect to not have this modified rule apply if they want to. I don't know why they would want to, but they could. Uh, if they do elect it, then, then the rules just apply as they always were. So in other words, all the 2019 EBIE being carried forward is subject to those, those, uh, those three ways of, of deducting them that I described on the last slide. So let's just go through an example. I just want to illustrate to you how this would work for a partnership for 2019 versus 2020, because I think it just helps form a picture of, uh, of how these rules play out. So let's just take this, uh, this partnership, for example. Um, if there was no limit at all in their interest expense, they would have $800,000 of taxable income. But 
because this limit applies, they have to add back a depreciation and interest expense to get to the EBITDA, which is $3.3 million, or their ATI is $3.3 million. And in 2019, they can take 30% of it. So the maximum interest expense that this partnership can deduct is $990,000. They have a million five of interest expense. So what that means is that $510,000 um, excess can't be deducted by the partnership. And it winds up getting pushed down to the partners in, in, um, as excess business interest expense. Uh, suppose you have a partner, uh, partner A, who has a 40% interest in the partnership. Uh, he gets allocated uh, 204,000, which is that's his 40% share of the 510,000 that's disallowed. He then has to carry that forward until 2020. Now, in 2020, uh, let's just assume the same exact uh, amounts. The partnership just <laughs> winds up having the exact same uh, net income that it had in 2019. Nothing's nothing's different. The only thing different now is the limit and the rules and, and the way that they're applied. So now um, we still have the 3.3 million of ATI, but we're allowed to deduct, to deduct 50% of it. So that gives us a limit of a million six fifty. We only have a million five. So what happens is in 2020. The interest expense isn't limited at all at the partnership level. The partnership can deduct all million five. And so there's no EBIE to push down to the partners. But what happens is it's got 150,000 of its limit that it didn't use. And it can actually push that down to the partners and, and maybe let them use some, some other interest expense that's being carried forward that they previously allocated. But remember, partner A is still carrying forward 204,000 of EBIE from 2019. Because of the special rule, they can deduct 50% of that without any kind of limit. So they can take 102,000, no questions asked. The um, the only difference is that the remaining 102,000 is just subject to those normal three ways of, of uh, the, those limits of being able to deduct it. So if the partnership allocates any ETA to the partners, they can then use that to, to absorb some of that other interest expense that they're carrying forward. So there's a couple of things we don't know yet about these rules. Um, one of the things was that uh, that real estate and farm businesses were allowed to elect out of 163J. And because they did that, they were not subject to these rules. Now, this, this is generally an irrevocable election once made. So what we're not sure about is, are they gonna, is there going to be some kind of relief for real estate and farm businesses that previously elected out? Because they, when they did it, they did it based on, on what they knew at the time. They based, on, they based it on the 30% limit applying to all their interest expense. And um, what they had to give up was they had to use qualified uh, for qualified improvement property uh, under the old rule. Uh, Dawn's going to explain this uh, uh, in her presentation, but uh, you could take bonus depreciation um, on certain assets. And I think they intended to, uh, for qualified improvement property to be eligible for bonus depreciation. But there was a glitch under the under the Tax Cuts and Job Act that didn't allow that to be taken. So a lot of people made decisions, a lot of real estate businesses made the decision to elect out of 163J on the assumption that they couldn't deduct that anyway, and they didn't want to lose any interest expense, so they elected out. So they may not be able to elect that now unless the IRS gives them some special approval. So we'll right. keep you posted as we find these things out. Great, okay, well I've got, uh, I think we fixed our um, issues for uh, sound with uh, Barry. So I'm going to go back to our business impact section. All right, Barry, talk to us about what's happening with businesses and, and the rules here. Sure. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the employee retention credit. This is for 50% of the qualified wages paid after March 12th through the end of the year. The maximum amount of the credit is based on $10,000 of eligible wages. So 50% of that is $5,000, meaning if I pay uh, an employee $10,000 and take the credit, I will receive a $5,000 credit against my payroll costs. So the qualified wages include qualified health care costs. The retention credit is not available to government employers. And if I take advantage of the Paycheck Protection Program loan, the forgivable loan, I'm not eligible for the retention credit. So let's talk about this a little bit more. So if I am going to take this, if I have wages, Sarah, can we move on? Thank you. Uh, wages paid by PEOs or through management companies are eligible to that company. However, wages paid to related individuals, meaning family members, are excluded. If I'm taking other wage credits for those amounts, those are also excluded. The credit really offsets the Social Security payment on wages. 
um, after these additional reductions. Uh, but currently, the way it's going to work is it's going to offset 100% of your payroll tax liability. We'll need to see how these ultimately play out in further guidance. So who can take this credit? The, you have to have a trader business in 2020, which is partially suspended or fully suspended due to some government order limiting commerce. commerce. So stay-at-home orders, uh, requirements for certain types of business to close. Uh, again, any government order telling you you can't continue to do business the way you, you were. Or any business that had a decline in gross receipts of more than 50% from the prior equivalent quarter. So if my first quarter gross receipts in 2020 are below 50% of the prior period, I then would qualify and be eligible for to take that credit. And I will be continue to be eligible for the credit subject to the other limitations until my gross receipts recover and are over 80% uh, of the gross receipts from the same quarter of the prior year. So basically not when I go back above 50%, but when I go above 80, okay? A tax exempt organization, they only qualify if they're shut down to a government order. The gross receipts test obviously doesn't really come into play with them. Next. So who with uh, an employer, when you think of an employer, you think of an individual company, but there are these aggregation rules. And there's a, there's a number of entities here that would be considered related, and you have to look at them together. And the purpose for this, there's two main reasons, One, and we'll talk about those in a minute. One is employee count, because as you'll see in a minute, there's different benefits for employers with above 100 employees and below 100 employees. So you have to take that into account to determine which, which benefit these other, other related parties. Second is if I have two related parties, we talked about it not being eligible if you are in the Paytech Protection Program. If one of those entities gets a loan under that program, the other one doesn't, the other entity would not be eligible. So let's talk about employees with less than 100 uh, employees, employers. So if you have less than 100 employers, the wages that will count are all wages paid during the period the business is suspended or all wages paid during the quarter when the business experiences a 50% drop, subject to the $10,000 limit, okay? It doesn't include wages paid under any of the mandated emergency FMLA or sick leave. If you're over 100 employees, then the wages that count are only paid to employees not providing services. So if I've got employees who are providing services and I'm under 100 employees, that counts. If I'm over 100, those wages don't count. So that's a significant difference. Additionally, the, you're limited to wages of an employee not in excess what it would have been paid for the equivalent 30-day period prior to the decline or the suspension. So there are more limits on employers with more than 100 employees than there are under, under 100. There's an additional provision called the payroll tax deferral. And this is also available to the same set of employers. This is only on the employer's portion of the social security tax, the 6.2%. And what happens is any, any portion of the payroll tax attributable to that through the, from March 27, 2020 through December 31st, 2020 can be deferred. Half of that will be due by December 31st of 2021. The remaining half will be due to be due by December 31st of 2020. If you've got PEOs or third parties, the employer needs to instruct the PEO to take advantage of these provisions, and then the employer will be the one responsible for making the, the, the payment. Again, if you're taking advantage under the Paycheck Protection Program, you are not eligible for this credit. So as a planning note, again, Neither, you can't use either of these if you're taking the forgivable loan program, 
But however, if you're not, you can use both of these. So you could first take advantage of the credit, any amount that would be due attributable to the employer Social Security afterward would also be eligible for the deferral. But again, watch for the aggregation rules. So moving away from payroll, we're gonna move into NOLs. So there are two main changes here. One is a change to the carryback rule, and the other is a change to the taxable income limitation. So talking about the carryback rules, The NOLs from 2018, 19, and 20 now have a five-year carryback period. After tax reform, those, those were not eligible to be carried back. But now we're going to have a five-year carryback. The pre-tax reform rules are now in play, which also means that you are required to carry back unless you elect otherwise. So remember, if you have losses in 18, 19, and 20 that you do not want to carry back for whatever reason, you have to make an affirmative election. For 2018 and 2019 returns, if you're going to make that election, you have to make it on the first tax return due after the date of enactment. Date of enactment was a week ago, so generally the first returns due after the date of enactment are going to be your 2020 returns. So that's where you'll make that election. One thing you'll need to, to watch out for is that AMT rules will be in effect in the carryback. And also don't forget, the NOL rules apply to individuals as well as to corporations. Now, certain corporations that have foreign activity need to take a, a, another set of analysis here to determine the beneficial um, how, how beneficial these NOL carrybacks are going to be. If you have a year with 965 inclusion because of the change in the rules in 17, generally that's going to be 2017 or and or maybe 18. Um, you can exclude from your carryback time period that year. So if, if your year was 17, I can carry back a loss to all years other than 17, it has no impact on, on 17, and I just sort of skipped that almost as a zero year. And the reason is, is that the NOL carryback will not impact your 965 calculation. Additionally, if I create an overpayment in, in associated with a, the, in the year that I have a 965 deferred tax liability, because remember that was eligible to be paid over an eight year period, if I create a refund, it's going to be applied against that liability. It will not be refunded. So you need to be careful when, when, when you want to make the decision to uh, carry back to that year or to elect to forego. The other issue you have to worry about is if you have guilty or fitty um, income in some of those prior years, the nine, those provisions will, the carry back will change uh, those calculations, and there is no provision to exclude the 965. Your only option is to forego the, all the carryback. So you need to discuss this with somebody who's well-versed in the international arena. Next, moving on to the 80% limitation. Prior to, after, we're, we're moving forward, Tara. The, uh, there you go. So after tax reform, the NOLs were only available to offset 20%, 80% of taxable income. They've changed that. NOLs from 2018, 19, and 20 will not be subject to the 80% limit on carryback, nor will losses carried forward into 18, 19, and 20 be subject to the carryback. As an example, by carry, back an eight, carry forward an 18 loss to 2020, it will not be subject to the limit in 2020. If I carry that same loss forward to 2021, it will be subject to the 80% limit. So NOLs, obviously you wanna re review your 2018 and 2019 uh, returns to see if they have losses. The next thing you wanna do is look at those returns. Do I have a uh, qualified improvement property, which we'll talk about in a little bit, do I have 163J in 2019? That'll increase the loss. 
or for individuals, do I have changes to my excess business loss that are going to generate a loss or increase it and therefore get have an opportunity to carry back? You'll need to look at the 2013 through 17 returns, see if they've got taxable income. If you've got the 965 inclusion, you'll need to factor that in. Um, determine the potential for a carryback claim. If you're going to file in 20, for 2018 losses, it's probably going to be an 1120X. Um, for 2019 losses, it's a form 1139. Uh, 1139s are generally processed within 90 days. However, the IRS came out literally today and said, hey, our service centers are shut down. We're going to have a problem processing all these refund claims. So you're going to need to be patient until the IRS figures out how they're going to take, how they're going to allow taxpayers to take advantage of all these carryback claims. If you're not going to carry back, remember to make that election on the 2020 return. There's one other idea to get cash back. Um, if you're a corporation and have overpaid your estimated tax payment, then you can request what's called a quickie refund on form 4466. Generally, the IRS has 45 days to act. Again, because of their problems with the current environment, it may take longer. Uh, the overpayment has to exceed 10%, and this, this claim must be filed by April 15th. It has not been extended by notice 2020-18. So let's go through a quick example. Assume I have a corporation that paid in a million dollars in estimated taxes for 2019. My liability now is 700,000. So the 4446 can be filed by April 15th and claim a $300,000 refund. Again, in theory, within 45 days it should be returned. That may take longer. The 300,000 is in excess of the $700,000 tax, so I, I can do that. And then all I have to do is file the tax return in the normal course. Next. The next opportunity to get cash back is the AMT credit refund. AMT went away for corporations post 2017. And what was happening is you could use that minimum tax credit to offset regular tax. And then half of what was ever left over was going to be refunded through 2021. The CARES Act changed that. All of that is now immediately refundable in 2019. So if you're coming into the year 2019 with excess AMT credit, it will all be refundable on the 2019 return. There is a planning option here. You can elect on your 2018 return to, again, file the amend the 2018 and file for that refund claim. Uh, the process is a tentative refund claim, which is generally a Form 1139. Again, should be processed within 90 days. Service is probably going to struggle to do that. It still may be processed quicker than, than other methods. So you'll want to review all of your tax returns that come into 2019 with an AMT credit and figure out whether it's going to be more beneficial to claim in 2018 or 2019. And the last thing to note is with regard to some of these other programs under the CARES Act, so specifically the Paycheck Protection Program has a forgivable element to it. Generally, forgiveness of debt is income, but in this case, it is explicitly excluded from gross income. So the forgiveness portion of any loan will not be income. Second, for some of the larger corporations, the government is going to receive warrants, options, or stocks for some of the loan programs. If they do, it could cause issues with NOLs under 382. This act specifically says, no, it won't. And in some cases, the act provides for strict or straight grants. Generally, those are income to the recipients. There is no specific provision concerning the taxability in those, so, so those should be income. So just remember the differences between these various programs. And with that, we'll move on to the qualified improvement property. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and as we're getting going, and uh, Don, I think you're you're here. But just before you begin, just to remind folks, if you want a copy of today's slides, there uh, are in the handouts pod, which is in the the strip to the right of your of the presentation today. Find the handouts uh, pod, and you can download a PDF copy of today's slide. So Dawn, uh, talk to us about this wonderful, finally, we have this uh, in, 
technical correction to qualified improvement property. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, finally is the operative word here. Many taxpayers thought this correction would be made last year, didn't come, we had to file returns. So this is a sigh of relief for many people out there. So as we know, the CARES Act corrected the depreciable life of qualified improvement property from 39 years to 15 years. This allows qualified improvement property to benefit for the 100% bonus expensing rules that we were given with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So it's important to note this correction has been given to us on a retroactive basis back to 1-1-2018. So remember, on 1-1-2018, qualified improvement property was a surviving definition for all re, uh, improvements for buildings. The definitions for qualified leasehold improvement property retail improvement property and restaurants all went away. It's only qualified improvement property going forward. So let's talk about what is that definition and what is not that definition. So qualified improvement property is non-residential real estate. So that's a key there. Residential real estate does not count, such as apartments and nursing homes, etc. It is only improvements made to the interior of a building. So no exterior improvements count. No enlargements of a building, so if you increase the volume or if you increase the square footage, that does not count. If you've done any repairs to elevators, escalators, or any internal structural framework improvements, those also do not count. What does, what is, what the focus really is, what does count is the improvement must be placed in service after the original building is placed in service. So you can't purchase the building that had improvements made by a prior taxpayer and consider those qualified improvement property on your depreciation schedule. You, you must, as a taxpayer, have paid for the improvements yourself. So the best way to learn any definition is to go through several examples. So let's start with the first one. We Love to Build LLC began construction on a six unit retail plaza in December of 2017, so right at the end of the year. In June of 2018, they opened the anchor store for business, which was pet stuff. In November, two more retail spaces opened, and in December, four more retail stores open. So as you know, when the first store opens, you have to have a CO for your building. So your building shell must be placed in service. So really, we placed in service our shell, and we placed in service pet stuff. That is when the building went into service. So our qualified improvement property in this example would be our retail spaces in November that went into service and our December retail spaces, they are going to have a place in service date after that initial building went into service. We can consider that's been QIP, 15 year life, 100% bonus. So now let's think about if we just purchased a building. So ABC Partners purchased an office complex in 2018. At the time of purchase, it was fully leased. So we know it's an existing building, they're operating, they placed it in service, they're getting revenue. So as the leases expire, they plan to do future renovations. So not the original building purpose, uh, purchase, that will not get any QIP treatment, but all of the future renovations they do to just the interior portions of the building, as long as they're not elevator, escalator, or internal structural framework, they will be considered qualified improvement property and get the benefits of that definition. So now let's consider that we've purchased a restaurant. So fast food junkies purchased a burger joint in a, nearby, in a nearby city. This joint has been historically very profitable, so they were very happy to get it. Prior to 1118, when we had the restaurant rules, we automatically always said restaurants were 15 year life. Well, one thing to remember is that that definition is gone. Restaurant buildings are now treated like any other building. They do not have a specific carve out. So the initial purchase of this restaurant is not gonna get any benefit from a shorter class life. The only opportunity we'll have will be a cost seg study, just like any other building, to bring some of the spend into a shorter life. However, as they plan to do renovations in the future, and they plan to do renovations to the dining area, as long as they meet that definition, keep it to interior, et cetera, they will be able to do QIP 15 year life on that spend. All right, so let's talk about an apartment complex. So this is a typical example. We have White Oak Construction began construction of a new apartment complex, many buildings here. So and they started in January and in November, they have five buildings ready to go up and be leased and people start moving in. 
The common areas were also ready. So all of those buildings go into service as well as the common areas. In June of 2019, the remaining buildings go into service. So we have two different place and service dates here. Well, let's back up a minute. These are apartments. This is residential. This does not never get the definition, never meets the definition for qualified improvement property. So any renovations to an apartment, any future buildings, any future pieces that go into service are never going to enjoy this definition. Let's talk about an office scenario. So Big Law LLC has many offices around the country. They are leasing new office space in Nashville. This is in Nashville, this is a brand new building and they, this building is first gonna be placed in service in June of 2018. They've already signed their lease, but they are not the first to move in. Big Law is the second one to move into this building. So for this building, the first tenant that moves in or whoever goes in first with the building shell is going to be, that is when the building is placed in service. So since they are the second ones to move into the building, their place in service date is going to be after the initial building was placed in service. Now note that Big Law doesn't own the building, so it's not on their depreciation schedule, that initial building going into service, but you can look to somebody else's ownership of the building and the fact that the building was already placed in service by any taxpayer to say that your improvement went into service after that. So for this one scenario in Nashville, they will be able to enjoy qualified improvement property 15 year life for their uh, rent, uh, build out of their space. Now, same, almost exactly same uh, fact pattern here in Raleigh, they also are leasing new office space in a brand new building, however, in this case, they are going to be the first tenant to move in. So they are, their tenant improvement is going to go into service on the same exact day as the building shell is because they are going to be renting and that's exactly when it's ready for service for the owner. So they will not be able to take any QIP property because the dates are going to line up. So it's very, very important to pay attention to the dates. Okay, so the key takeaway, as I said, the place and service date is key. So you only have to have your renovations or your qualified improvement property go into service one day later. That does count. Our prior rule that we had for qualified leasehold improvement property was you had to have the building place in service for three years. That has been dropped for qualified improvement property, so it's a lot more liberal, but you do have to have a difference in your dates. So as Mike mentioned earlier, if you, if you elected out of 163J, and you have now have elected ADS for your building, any improvements that you make to that building will not qualify for bonus depreciation because under the alternative depreciation system, you are not allowed to have bonus depreciation. And you have to have a 20 year class life as opposed to a 15 year. Much better than a 40 year class life, but it's still not as good as 15 year in bonus. The last thing I will mention is if you are sitting there thinking about the fact that you have now on your depreciation schedule filed a return in 18 or perhaps 19 with a long class life for your improvement property, 39 years, you can correct that. I would advise you to talk to your tax advisor or exactly the best way to correct that, but just know you will be able to get that. There are many different considerations um, to be had. So I think, you know, every scenario is different. All right, I thank you, Dawn. Very fast. Yeah, no, that was uh, <laughs> excellent to to get through. So I'm going to skip back down to our uh, sort of next steps discussion and uh, talk about really sort of wrapping up everything that uh, Barry and Mike and Dawn have discussed. So sort of the takeaways here, please consider the CARES Act changes and how it might impact your 2019 business tax returns and individual returns. Uh, that means those returns that might already have been filed and those returns that are currently still in process. Uh, this interest expense, the excess uh, loss, the depreciation qualified improvement pro qualified improvement property, all of that is, are things that are retroactive, excuse me, the, the uh, interest expenses 19 and forward. Um, so that could have an impact on existing returns. Take a look at your 2019 re return and 18. If you haven't filed your 19 return, individual return yet, 
if your AGI is, I guess, just a gross income is lower in 18, then maybe you want to leave that return on file and have the IRS calculate the rebate based on that rather than accelerating your 19 return. Uh, but if you're expecting money back on a, a tax refund, you know, you certainly want to get that return filed as soon as possible because uh, it's, it's going to take time to issue those checks as well as all the rebate checks. A review fixed asset additions for qualified improvement property. That definition is effective in January 1 of uh, 18 forward, uh, but some of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act law affected items placed in service all the way back to September of, of 17. And so it might be a good time to go back and look at all of the activity and, and assets placed in service. Check into net operating loss changes. Can we make a loss bigger to carry back five years into tax years 13, 14, 15 to free up taxes paid in those years, get refunds now of that money, or it may be lost and never recoverable? Uh, and looking at that, um, consider whether you can make losses bigger by cost segregation studies or looking at, or free up additional cash by uh, filing and looking into research and development credits. This is a great opportunity to stop and reconsider a lot of planning opportunities because now we can create larger NOLs. We can, we do need more cash flow and it, it raises urgency. And I encourage everyone to continue to pay attention. Uh, the Families First Coronas, Coronas Virus Response Act the CARES Act and the SBA loan programs and others, uh, all the changes to extended due dates for filing and paying taxes. A lot has happened in just a very short number of weeks. And uh, we urge you to keep paying attention to this information. Uh, and uh, we're certainly keeping on top of it and starting to help our clients take a look at it too. And one of the places you can go is to our website, to the COVID-19 Guidance Center, where we're constantly populating with industry information, with tax information, with information about that, and also the Paycheck Protection Program, where we are gearing up to help answer lots of questions that are coming in about that uh, as well. So listen, we thank you very much for your attendance today and for your questions. Uh, we will be posting some frequently asked questions again at this COVID-19 Guidance Center page that we're receiving in our presentations. Um, and thank you to Barry and to Mike and to Dawn for sharing what we know right now from the CARES Act and how it impacts our federal taxes. Thank you all. We appreciate it.